So thank you so much for uh, joining us in this session. It's great to see all of you here. We know that you are actually in greater number than it looks like looking out at you, but um, at some point we're actually hoping for some conversation and discussion. So if you decide you'd like to migrate towards the center, towards the mics, that would be great. I'm Lisa Hinchliffe. I'm the coordinator for information literacy services and instruction, as well as the coordinator for strategic planning at the University of Illinois Library at Urbana-Champaign. And I am very excited to be working with Andrew Escher. I'm the assessment <laughs> librarian at, uh, for the Indiana University Bloomington Libraries. And we're here together um, engaging on this topic of analytics and privacy, coming to it from sort of two different perspectives, but that have led us to be in some really engaged conversations over the past couple years around negotiating the boundaries between the value that we're trying to create as libraries and the value that we have on privacy. And some of you were perhaps in the last session on privacy, the first session after the keynote, also in this room, which raised some of these same very important issues and ideas. I myself come to this topic thinking deeply about it because of my work when I was ACRL president on creating the value of academic Academic libraries initiative where we came to understand that with the accountability that libraries are under we need to be able to tell our story of the impact that we have on the users that we have as well as the importance of using data in order to improve our services so we can have greater impact be more efficient in our operations and the like and one of the things that we really put forward in that report and in that initiative was the importance of data collection and honestly, beginning data collection at the individual user level. And so, quite contrary to some of our historic practices of aggressively discarding data about our users and what they're doing. What I've learned over the past four years as a result is, that's gonna take some conversation about whether we want to do this, and if we want to do it, how are we going to do this? And I found Andrew to be a great partner in this conversation because he, while we're probably both in the middle of the spectrum on this, he might be on the other side. Uh, so what we're presenting today really builds on a lot of questions that began uh, last August at the ARL assessment conference, and I'm sure many of you were there, about the tension between uh, using this data and linking this data up with, linking library up with institutional data um, and protections on uh, user privacy. Um, and also things like thinking through the risks to our individual users and uh, thinking through issues of consent of the people that we're um, gathering this data from. Um, my background is in anthropology. I come into libraries from the social sciences side. And so I've, I've been thinking through this data, uh, especially in relation to uh, human subjects research um, and the ethics of human subject research. And so I'm coming at it from, from a little different perspective um, than Lisa and really building on that background I have in, in social science research and thinking about if I were designing data collection um, for a anthropological or sociological protocol, what would be the things I would think through for um, these types of uh, data items? So thinking through this, um, Andrew often reminds me about the importance of privacy and I often remind him about the importance of developing excellent services. So hopefully over time we'll be able to come up with a framework that lets us do both. <clears throat> As was well demonstrated um, not too long ago in this very room, users leave a trail of data throughout our library systems and with the work that they do elsewhere on campus and on the free open internet. Many also of our campuses are aggressively moving towards collecting data about students and their learning analytics or their, um, their activities as students and they are capturing that data and collecting that data intending hopefully to make a better undergraduate learning experience for our students. So one of the questions that we should that we need to think about with this is how will we connect our library data with that campus user data um, do we want to? Does the campus want us to? Are they asking us to? All of those sorts of questions. But it's sort of a given that people are leaving a trail of data. And even without the um, 
you know, extensive things that we saw earlier today with Wireshark and the cookie sniffer and some of those other technologies, users are still leaving trails of data, um, may or may not be super personally identifiable, but as much as we might expunge, for example, circulation records, while they have the book checked out, there is a record that they have it checked out. And many of us um, have any number of other places in our libraries that we're collecting data even not on the network services, though clearly the network services are collecting data. And I really appreciated the, I think it was a library director who came up in the last session and said, okay, so what should I do about this? Like, should I just give up on privacy? Should I keep going with what I've do, been doing, which is restricting the development of services because we're trying to protect privacy? Really, that's the question I think we're grappling with today, which is how do we balance, and I'm gonna pull out two components of the ALA Code of Ethics. It is absolutely the case that the ALA Code of Ethics has a code statement around privacy which says that we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to the information sought and received, resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. But in this very same statement, Code of Ethics, it also says that we provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous response to all requests. So really, while we've grappled, I think, and come to see some of the challenges to the privacy statement in the Code of Ethics, one might begin to ask ourselves the question of whether all of this data, whether we actually have an ethical obligation to put that data to use in the development of this highest level of service to our library users. In addition, I would point out that while we're obligated to protect library users' right to privacy, at least this document um, does not provide any guidance on how a library should respond to a user who themselves seeks to disclose information about themselves. And so while we protect, um, there's, there's an open question on how much libraries should enable sharing if a user wants to, um, or whether we sort of continue in a sort of paternal role saying, oh no, we won't let you. So there's a lot of questions here, even with if we're protecting data and we have data, about how it plays in with user agency as well as our service development. So as Andrew and I talked through this, we came up with five assertions. And the next slide is why you might want the handout because it's kind of a wall of text. Um, so if you don't have one, they're in the back on yellow sheets of paper. It's the same text that's on the slide, but we just thought it might be easier to look at it in front of you. So we have five assertions that we'd like to put forward. Um, that given the increased emphasis on analytics in higher education, it is not a matter of if libraries will participate, it is a matter of how. Um, our campuses themselves are collecting data about library use inadvertently or, advert or on purpose. And so other people have data about what users are doing in our libraries because those logs are going through campus servers, they're going through the network traffic and the like. So one of the questions we might wanna ask ourselves is, if this data is being collected, how do we want to engage with it? Or do we want to leave other people to engage with it? We also will assert that library user data can be useful in the development of high quality services. Um, one of the areas that is very clear that people like the um, customized experience of a lot of the web tools that they use. Um, where Google begins to learn you and say, well, this is the kinds of things you're looking for. The ability to connect your own Evernote to Google so that it's searching across your personal collection as well as the Google corpus. These sorts of things are only possible with data that connects different systems together. We also point out that libraries already collect identifiable user data and enable collection of that data by third parties. Um, all of our vendors are actually collecting data on all of the searches that our libraries are, users are doing in their systems. Um, they use that data to improve their tools and products, I hope, um, I presume. We might wanna ask ourselves um, whether we're benefiting from that data in the same way. 
We also point out that to meaningfully relate library use data to other institutional data requires user identifiers. So sometimes librarians talk about like, well, we'll collect it in the abstract, and then we'll sort of say, well, we'll take this aggregate data about students, and we'll connect it to institutional aggregate data. You really can't get analysis done on that level um, that's gonna help us develop our information systems. Um, and then the final thing that we do have to admit is that it's really difficult to predict future uses of created data sets. So it's possible today to say, well, this doesn't seem like so bad, or alternatively, I don't know, should we collect this or not? In the future, this cuts both ways. Data could be collected that could turn out to be harmful to people if it's released. On the other hand, if we don't collect that data, it may be harmful for us to develop the kinds of services that we want to. But I would kind of go further here and say that if we are collecting the data, and presumably we're securing it and encrypting it and doing all those good things, we probably have an ethical obligation to use the data. And Andrew will talk a little bit more about that in this next part. So, but before we go on, we wanted to give people a chance to say, these assertions seem wrong to me, they seem right to me, they seem incomplete. Questions, comments? Okay, we're gonna go forward with silent equals consent, which really wouldn't work for IRB, but it'll work for us right here. So. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk through uh, some library use data practices um, in the hopes of starting a, a broader discussion. Um, and I, I'm framing these as related to especially the ongoing data collection that we do um, in our libraries as a matter of our day-to-day -day op operations, um, kind of bracketing out uh, things that we might do for specific projects. Um, so here, we're really thinking about a framework that would apply to the everyday data collection that we're doing, and the assumption that this library data could be um, connected to other institutional data, things like uh, student achievement data, financial aid data, uh, GPA uh, engagement, and those um, sorts of things that are becoming more and more important as we think about um, student and educational analytics. Um, I come at this from the side that we have an ethical responsibility to our users to think through the risks and benefits of any data that we're collecting about them. Um, so I'm a bit more conservative um, from where I'm coming from uh, than Lisa is. Um, and here I would like to talk through especially um, thinking about principles um, about data collection and usage uh, rather than mechanisms um, for the sake of this conversation. Um, so we've developed seven uh, recommendations, um, and again, I, I refer you to your handout because this will be quite difficult to see um, on, on the single screen, um, but we wanted to get it all in one place uh, for reference. And I'll just talk through each of these um, in turn and, and develop them a little more um, before we move into our discussion. Uh, the first is that libraries should regularly undertake a privacy and data collection audit. Um, of their systems as well as their procedures within the library um, and, and pay particular attention to the levels of risk um, presented by these kind of data. Um, this is something I think we really need to think about doing regularly and making a regular part of our library operations. Um, institutions vary pretty widely in how they approach this, uh, but I think it's safe to say that many um, institutions, including my own, um, have not done this as recently as we should have and don't do this as regularly as we should. Uh, second, uh, the data collected should be aggregated at a level, a level that balances analytical specific, specificity with user privacy. So we should, we should think about what level of aggregation we actually need uh, before we collect data. Um, because we can use aggregation as a strategy um, to help de-identify data and help protect user privacy. So for example, we could collect things um, at the level of uh, students in particular programs rather than the uh, level of individual students. Um, so we should think very carefully about the level of specific specificity we actually need. Um, third, and I'll, I'll talk about this one a bit um, in a bit more detail, is this issue of transaction level data. Um, and I think, 
I really think that we should be very, very careful about collecting data that identifies both a specific item or a specific resource um, and specific users. And I don't think we should collect this uh, systematically, but we should only do this um, if we have a good reason we have a specific purpose. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, why. Um, and if we do collect this data, we should develop measures such as local encryption of files and separating um, identifying keys from uh, demographic data sets in order to further um, protect the individuals um, contained in these data sets. And the reason I, f I worry about this um, particular data specifically is because I think it's inherently risky. Um, if we think about what a data set of that looks like, um, we could potentially collect every search of every user and every resource used or viewed of every researcher in our libraries. Um, so at my library, that would be 40 to 50,000 people per year, and we can do it in perpetuity. Um, so it's a really, um, a really large um, and detailed data set, um, and we really don't know what that data could be used for. Um, this kind of data, once it exists, um, is subject to things like uh, subpoenas, um, for any of you who've been following the Boston College um, uh, research on the Troubles in Ireland, a data set um, was learned to exist, and this was an a, uh, interview data set, but it was learned to exist by authorities and then it was subpoenaed. Um, so once we create these kinds of data sets, it really opens us up to um, the potential for, for a lot of, uh, for exploration um, by law enforcement um, and various other things that we may or may not have the ability to defend um, once, we, once we get the, the subpoena or the national security level uh, letter in some cases. Um, and in many cases, our privacy policies already explicitly forbid this kind of data collection. And at Indiana, our um, privacy policy does forbid this data collection, um, even though we have the ability. And as we've seen earlier today, many of our um, resources may be logging this data um, behind the scenes. Um, in a way that, that could potentially be analyzed or, or data mined. Uh, fourth, uh, data sets containing user demographic data should be destroyed after a reasonable time period. Um, and this is especially to, um, to prevent things like re-identification analysis, which has become easier and easier, um, and to protect uh, the long-term interests of our users um, so we don't have this data sitting around uh, so it can be used in you know, what other, whatever ways it wasn't intended to um, at the beginning. Uh, fourth, we need to develop new consent procedures, um, and we need to review the ones we have um, and provide more explicit opt-out or opt-in um, for uh, this type of data collection. I think many of our privacy policies aren't sufficient, um, given the, the new risks of this kind of data. Um, and also, they're not sufficient because there is no effective alternative for students. Um, and thinking through from a institutional review board or a human subject perspective, this really wouldn't be um, adequate, an adequate form of consent because there is no alternative. It's a form of coercion, um, if we're thinking through it from a, a sociological research point of view. Um, it's also problematic because no one reads our privacy statements, and so the consent that we're gathering by um, the tacit usage is an informed consent. Um, so it's really problematic. Uh, sixth, libraries should hold vendors to the same data analysis and retention standards um, that we hold ourselves to, and we shouldn't purchase or, or otherwise use data from these vendors um, that doesn't meet our ethical standards. So if we decide that our, this type of data shouldn't be collected and used, we shouldn't then go out and purchase it from someone else. Um, so this is the issue of, the, the data will be either collected by us or others will collect it about us and then we'll wind up using it anyway. I um, mean, we should really make sure that we review those contracts um, and policies very, very carefully. Um, and then finally, libraries should advocate for their institutions to develop um, and adopt a code of practice for data related to learning analytics. And this is not just in libraries, but across the institution. Um, in the absence of institutional codes, um, we should think about developing our own. Um, and this is really what's motivating this uh, conversation today and, and this framework is we want to start this conversation with you um, and we'll be carrying this forward. We're planning a follow-up uh, presentation at ALA um, on this after we have about six months of conversation, um, thinking through what might this code of practice or code of ethics look like. Um, and so we'll open it up to uh, discussion.
good, Peter. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> Oops. Are you not participating in the discussion? <laughs> not yet. But Todd's got one in the back. Now it's oh, on. now it's on. Um, Peter McDonald, uh, California State University, Fresno. Lisa and I have served on the ACRL Values Committee and talked a lot about this topic. A um, couple of comments and then maybe a question or two. Um, I, I really, well first, the CSU, the largest university system in the United States, has had a white paper approved by the Chancellor's Office that essentially codifies this in different languages and provides cover for any university in the system to um, expand swipe technology from um, uh, circulation to any site in the library. Um, and what the basis of that document says is that we are interested that a student used a service or an instruction module or a uh, whatever, not what they were after. So when they come to the reference desk, that they came, we don't believe it's a privacy issue. What they talked about, we consider a privacy issue. And that's both a statement and a question. I'd like your opinion on that. That's how we've vetted it. Um, and two universities have done, have opened up swipe um, to every aspect of library service, and that's Fresno State and Cal Poly. Um, both in the CSU system. And of the thousands of swipes, we have, it, it is statistically negligible that a single student has raised a red flag. So one in a thousand. Um, so, so why am I swiping? The rest swipe, and swipe is our method of getting that information beyond the circulation desk. Um, so I guess, a couple of questions. There are products now like Tableau, which are dashboard data products that universities are buying to do. And they regularly display student data with grades and GPA and so forth. So there's a real move amongst the vendors to make this data pretty leaky. Um, I'm not aware in the CSU of a single instance of breach of student um, um, privacy data anywhere in the system and for as long as I've known this system. And California has a state law where it is actually codified in the law that library records are private. Um, so I guess two questions. One, do you really feel that that comment, it's that they came that we're trying to get at, which is your number three, in, I think, um, and not what, I mean, the fact they may have asked this question or that question, we're trying to aggregate that these students came. And the swipe lets you know information about their ethnicity, maybe, or whatever, if you correlate it to PeopleSoft. But it's, it, their privacy is protected because we're not capturing the what. And I'd like, given the students swipe day and night and reveal their lives every minute of the day on social media, um, you know, what role does vendors have in protecting that data? Because I see on Tableau, which we have uh, at Fresno State, wow, pop right in and anybody can seem to get to student data. I can't get to PeopleSoft. My circulation staff can. But um, anyway, uh, were those two questions yeah. sort of mm -hmm. clear? So one of the things I guess I would resist even with my advocacy that we collect and use the data for decision making is any argument that says students or users don't care. Um, I don't think that's a very compelling argument for collecting data, not the least of which is it is, it is, it takes resources to collect and analyze data. Um, so, and I think that, um, so that, that to me is sort of like a non-starter, whether people care or not. Um, as far as whether we should do something or not, or, and whether we should give up on our value on privacy. I think one of the things we want to distinguish between is 
Um, this whole question of data that is then aggregated and shared out to show patterns, which is what Tableau is doing, versus the individual student's record, which I, I believe typically would not be displayed as an individual record even without an identifier on it. Um, but I think one of the other things that you said in there is an interesting question that we need to grapple with. So I personally would say it's sure a lot better to know that they came to the reference desk than to not know it at all. But I could posit any number of questions that I might like to be able to interrogate, particularly if I can connect that with learning analytics that might be interesting that, that the fact that they came won't sufficiently answer. So it's absolutely, I mean sure, you can now answer more questions about the learner by knowing that they came, but there's a pretty big difference between they came and asked me about something for a class, and that's even still an, that's still a, that's not a, you know, transaction, or they came and asked me about something that's a personal interest. Still not recording what was asked, but at least into a category of type of thing that was asked. But even more so, what if it's which class, right? So now, so there's layers here that I think you have to untangle and say which of these things is the institution trying to figure out. In most cases, I think our institutions are trying to figure out how to have students be successful in a class and then in completion. So retention and completion, so you've got two dimensions. Once you add in the in a class dimension, knowing that they came to the desk is probably, it's gonna help, but it's not gonna ask all the, answer all those kinds of questions that we wanted. But now, Andrew, <laughs> all the things you'd like to not collect. Yeah, well, I, I, you, bring, you bring up a really, a, a number of really interesting issues. Um, the first is uh, thinking about things like Tableau. Um, I think Tableau has a really specific problem with its structure um, in that you can't turn off the background data um, when you present it, um, and that, that's a big issue. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, a little surprised that people haven't thought about the FERPA implications of having things like grade point average in, in those. I mean, maybe, maybe it's, um, if it's locked down within stu in the institution, that's kind of the solution we've had at IU um, as long as it's internal to the institution, um, we consider everyone to, to have access to a certain number of records. Um, but the potential for leakage of one of those data sets is really, really high. Um, and like we were discussing this morning, I think once we start creating those kinds of data sets, um, the issue isn't whether or not there will be information getting out, but how bad and when. Um, and I think that that causes me to want to think very, very hard about the, the data sets I keep in the long term and where they're stored and what information is in them. Um, and that has to do both with the tools and with the data set itself. Um, I think I, I broadly agree with um, what Lisa was saying in terms of the, the aggregation. It's certainly wonderful to know um, if the students, it's better to know that the students are there and broadly what they're using them to not know at all. But then we have to think, how much further do we want to go with that? Because the follow-up questions that I always get when we start talking about those is, which resources are they using? Because that's a collection and development issue. Um, which departments are they in? Because then we can staff the reference desk better. Um, and so we can start getting pretty fine-grained about the demographic things that go into that. And then we can, it would be interesting to know every resource that a student would use for particular courses, um, especially some big courses that we have repeated every year um, because that has interesting, um, interesting implications in a lot of areas of our library. And so as we start doing this, there's, there's more and more push to keep this kind of data and to keep it in the long term um, and to get into this transaction level data. Um, and it, and it, it starts getting pushed against more and more and more. And so that's part of, part of what we're trying to do is to, is to um, hopefully get out in front of some of these questions that we're, we're talking about at our, at our institutions as we start to combine up these types of data sets is to think about, okay, maybe the risk of having this information outweighs the benefit. Um, because I'm a real firm believer in, the, in that just because we can collect this kind of data doesn't make it ethical to do so. And there's a lot of literature out talking about big data broadly outside of just the educational context about this kind of ethical decision, just because 
people create this data about themselves doesn't necessarily mean as researchers it's ethical for us to use it, even if we can just go grab it, even if it's public, even if it's on Facebook. Um, and I think we, we really have an obligation to think about that, um, especially from an institutional, an institutional standpoint. I want to try and challenge that by putting in place an international dynamic, and I'm thinking particularly about your point <coughs> six and this notion of vendors being held to the same standards and we shouldn't deal with vendors who don't do mm -hmm. what we want. The ALA is, I think, the fifth, uh, I think it's the fifth um, professional body in our field that I've been a member of in four different countries. And I've just been checking and every one of those bodies has a different set of ethical standards and codes of conduct. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in this particular area, almost contradictory. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious also that in the different countries in which I've worked, the um, data protection type legislation varies and again things that are possible in one country may not be possible in another and finally I'm conscious that many of the vendors to which you refer are operating in a global marketplace mm -hmm. is it reasonable to expect them to suit every need or are we going to try and impose a world view that plays to the narrowest possible view of what constitutes ethical practice, mm -hmm. just to be provocative. So I think part of the, you know, the, the unsettled uh, thing in number six is we say hold them to the same standards, but we haven't really said what those standards should be, except putting out here that we should begin to develop this. Um, and it, sort of the same tension that we have around, well, what level of data should we collect? We could also have that tension in what, how detailed should a set of standards in this, this or best practices in this area be? So we could have something that says, thou shalt never collect data about an individual person ever without their absolute consent. Or we could have something that says, um, there should be policies developed around the collection of individual data and how it is shared. And so it might be quite reasonable, I think, to to assert to every vendor that you should have policies around this that you will share with us, um, that we can then make an assessment about whether or not it fits within our understanding of what's acceptable. It may not be a reasonable thing to say that every vendor should have to comply with every single library's interpretation of how these things would play out. Because I think it's also quite likely that um, any given set of libraries that we look at will find the point in this in a different place as far as balance between service development and, ten and the tension around privacy. But I think that is a, it's, it sort of asks the question in some ways of what level do we need to determine this kind of standard or best practice? It's a great point. Um, my, my comment just about mm -hmm. students don't care is really that this is really important because it's mm -hmm. so easy to say, well, you know, this data is being right. gathered everywhere and so forth. So I really took your comment. Um, so if you, it, getting a little beyond whether we should be capturing this data or not and how we do it and, and the ethical standards, if you use you know, you're, you've been on the values committee and you know we're sort of hitting some brick walls mm -hmm. and certainly if you did the poster sessions at the uh, assessment in action at ALA, you realize there are hundreds of libraries now doing assessment mm -hmm. and they're all coming up against this problem that you're, you're not like a medical trial taking 100 people who eat, have the placebo and 100 mm -hmm. who get the cancer pill and you can see which ones. And our, so I'm gonna pose an ethical question. So it's an embedded librarian in Gen Ed 101 English, 200 students. What's the ethics of giving full library service to 100 students and not doing squat for the other 100 to see whether that 100 that got the service actually does better? Because I think there are a lot of people grappling with that, because that actually is a sort of methodologically more sound type of study, speaking to what Lisa said, that it just aggregates don't 
necessarily get you much. So I'm just curious on your thoughts. So first, we'll resist anything that says that it's methodologically more sound to use scientific controlled research experimental trials when it comes to other kinds of questions we might be asking about the world. Um, anthropological, ethnographic, qualitative can all be very methodologically sound. Whether or not they meet our sense of what is scientific um, and sort of an abstracted sort of way is a different question. But I'm, I'm quite confident that Andrew will be able to just pull out a bunch of stuff here about the ethics of denial of service. So. Yeah, so you're hitting up, you're hitting up against uh, an, another issue that we didn't really talk about too much yet, um, is whether or not this type of research falls under the auspices of our um, ethical review boards. Um, so I'm fairly certain that the, the study you just described as kind of a, a big example um, would be interpreted as human subject research um, at my institution um, and would then need to be evaluated by the Institutional Review Board, um, which would probably say that it was not ethical to deny students um, services in order to, to have an experiment. Um, but they would certainly review it and there would be a negotiation process. Um, I don't, I think that kind of research isn't, the reviewed research like that is not necessarily problematic. Uh, we just need to think through the, the, as we would for any other type of human subject research, what are the risks and benefits um, and what are the, you know, the potential problems with it. Um, but then there's all this other data and research that we're doing that sort of falls under, um, is sort of exempted from institutional review because it's, it's data that's collected, it's data that's collected like student demographic data. Um, so it's automatically collected, it's used for improving the institutions, the things that fall under the automatic exemptions of the IRB. And now we're really hitting up against issues that cross over into these two different areas. Um, and it's really hard to find the right institutional place to have some of these discussions because I couldn't go to my IRB, IRB and say, okay, I'm collecting this, I, I'm, I've decided that we should collect this data, here's what I think the risks and benefits are, and I'm gonna do it in perpetuity, because the IRB isn't set up to address very well those kind of things, these kind of institutional data collection things. Um, and so that's one kind of weak point um, in this. Um, so I've kind of... Yeah. So I think the other thing that I would add to this is, um, this whole, so you mentioned assessment in action. I appreciate you mentioning that, Peter, because as one of the co-leaders of that, I'm struggle. I'm 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 there for all 75 institutions last year and all 75 institutions this year that are struggling through this question, which is what is the right sort of research method or assessment method to learning what we want to learn in. And so part of what becomes crucial here is this sort of tension as well between proving our value. You know, we went in, we taught this session, look, everyone learned, and therefore now they're better human beings. That kind of claim that we'd like to make. Um, and sort of the, the other version of assessment, which is this is diagnostic, it helps us plan future interventions. Um, it's not necessarily about making your budget request, right? So untangling these two purposes is really important as well. Um, but there are, I think also just res you know, with respect to your particular question, one of the things that we could just do so much better at that we that doesn't even have to push us towards the, let's see what happens if we deny humans the services that we've promised them, um, would be things like, we are not even good at knowing when we design our research studies, typically, whether the student actually received the instruction that we're claiming had an impact. So if you look at most studies, for example, of library instruction, they never actually take attendance to determine whether the students who you intended to impact were actually present for said instruction. So at best, what we're actually able to claim is a student who was enrolled in a class in which the faculty member scheduled a session, did it have an impact? Well, I don't think any of us actually think that there's an impact of just being enrolled in a class that the faculty member happens to have instruction in, right? So we've got this sort of need to really get a lot more specificity in what we're really studying, which I think is where IRB processes can sometimes help us with this. Um, 
The other thing I just think is worth mentioning about IRB is a lot of times people like to say, oh, IRB requires us to X, Y, or Z. Um, they don't require anonymity. They, they don't even always require confidentiality. Um, so it's not IRB that's going to regulate sort of our decisions ultimately on privacy. So in some ways, I think that's also one way. Another thing we don't want to go to is sort of saying, well, we'll let the IRB decide. So Todd. This is a <clears throat> Todd Carpenter with NISO. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you uh, kind of advancing it. Thank you. The thinking about this from the perspective of vendors mm -hmm. and some of the services that they provide. Um, thinking here about some of the index discovery services, some of the altmetrics mm -hmm. analysis that is provided. Uh, a number of these systems actually require data and data analytics in order to function. Right. <laughs> and so, I mean, how could you, how could a system like, say, Ex Libris's BX system work if you adhere to some of these policies? Um. And, and are you then explicitly saying that we shouldn't be using recommender services based on user behavior. So which one of these do you think says you couldn't do the things that are necessary for BX? I'm just, just to help focus the discussion. Number six, because it says they should adhere to our same standards. Well, certainly six. Okay. Uh, By which you're saying four. that there's already an assumption that collecting this data isn't okay. Right, but okay. also four, mm -hmm. uh, because who's to say what a reasonable time is based on, you know. Well, that was actually our wiggle so room the, for the, getting out of this. The, <laughs> you know, the, a reasonable time is right. the next time the user wants to search for that information. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, uh, again, Mm -hmm. transactional level data that identifies the user right? Uh, and specific item mm -hmm. is also, you're going to run into problems there. Yeah, well, unless required for a specific or limited okay. purpose. So. No, I mean, I uh, take your point. I take your point. I mean, this is exactly the question. Do we want to be able to have services like BX re Recommender? And I don't, I, and, and I, yeah. I just, that's one yeah. obvious. I think there are other systems that use that data in less obvious ways. Correct. That enhance those those systems. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the special sauce that you'll never hear about. Right. Um, so I'm wondering how a, a vendor would be able to comply with some of these, um, these policies or recommendations. I think these are good questions. Um, and partially putting out these seven things is a matter of saying, OK, if these aren't the seven things, um, what are the seven things? Um, where do we want to, to land with this? And I guess I'll make it a little bit more um, sort of complex for us, which is um, from what I see, at least in the science community, they're perfectly happy to be going ahead and developing all kinds of tools and resources that historically we would have thought as library tools and resources, just having attended Shaking It Up 14 via virtual streaming all kinds of services that are based on use data that the libraries are not engaging with. And so this also becomes part of the question. And so maybe these seven are too restrictive. It, is it a kind of, rebuttal or an agreement? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Actually, it just it, it raised in my mind some of the other related services where patrons are participating and willingly giving their information mm -hmm. for like Mendeley. Um, and how do you see use of systems like that where they are intentionally providing information to a third party mm -hmm. to, to get access to things <laughs> right. um, and intentionally sharing that data with their friends, colleagues, et cetera. Yeah. So, and that's, I think, that question, too, of the degree to which so Mendeley exists, whether the library, like, wants it to or not. Right? It's out there, people can use it. So do we say, but we will have nothing to do with this tool because of those things? Or do we say, this is an important tool, clearly our users have said, and not only should we 
help them use it, help them use it better, we should actually maybe start thinking about how we can use data from Mendeley to drive other services that we offer in the library. So we're actually going to be a consumer of that shared data in some way in order to drive forward our other services. Um, so I'd just say a, a couple things. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll get a, a little more radical for a second. Um, <laughs> So I think we should think about how we can opt in people to those kind of services rather than just gathering their data and, or forcing them to figure out how to opt out. Um, second, I, just as an example, I killed my own Mendeley account because I no longer thought once it got acquired by Elsevier I could trust its privacy protections. Um, and I think number six was, was probably driven a little more by a feeling, um, especially that I have, that libraries should be willing to use the power of the purse to get our vendors to do what we want them to do. And so when I, we, we should say we're willing not to buy something because we don't think it, it follows the kind of ethical data collection standards that we want. And here I'm thinking of things like eBooks um, and other things. Um, we should be willing to just say, no, we're not going to buy it. Um, and then finally, I think we have to think about whether or not we're willing to kill services because we don't think that they're ethically viable. Um, and that's, a, that's something we can choose to do or choose not to do. And I think er, people will have different opinions on that. Um, I may be a little further, further down the road than Lisa is, but <laughs> um, just not to cite any specific examples or specific things, but I think those are, those are hard discussions that we need to think about having. Um, in a much more critical way. And I think our, our conversation has not caught up with the level of, of data collection and, and the services and the tools that, where those things are right now. Our conversation isn't where it needs to be because the tools are outrunning us. And you know, and this is a funny thing because I might also say that we also shouldn't buy things when the vendors won't share data with us that we want. So we might have a, a, a similar like, <laughs> neither of us will buy this tool, but Andrew won't buy it because the data is collected and I won't buy it because they won't give me the data. Um, I think this has been a, a I hope it's been thought provoking for you. I know it has been for me. I already want to pull up this file and revise some of the text. Andrew and I would love to hear from any of you that have suggestions, additions, challenges, criticisms, and the like. Um, but for now, I think we should move the conversation to a more um, convivial uh, setting of the conference reception. So thank you.